Hello, my name is John Whitcomb, and today I'd like to speak to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. This verse says, from Paul, Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Some versions even say you are disqualified from entering heaven. Paul is asking the Corinthian Christians to consider a sobering question. Are you really a Christian? And are you really saved? We need to ask ourselves that same question. The answer determines where you will spend eternity. Sadly, there are some who assume that they're Christians when really they're not saved. Are we saved because we simply believe in God? James says, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. So apparently that require, it requires more than just belief. Are we saved because we can recite the day and hour that we actually accepted Jesus? Are we saved because we know how to be saved? Because we know how to recite the sinner's prayer? So it takes more than just belief. It takes more than just the words to know for sure that we're saved. And it's a hard truth to accept, but it's better to know now than to find out later that there are other things that we should have been aware of. Well, certainly we can't expect perfection of ourselves in this life, but we should see real evidence of improvement, evidence of change, evidence of Jesus Christ living in us and through us. I'm reminded of the parable of the sower. Matthew 13, 18 to 23, and I'm gonna read from the message. Study this story of the farmer planting seed. When anyone hears news of the kingdom and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's hand and heart. This is the seed that the farmer scattered on the road. The seed cast on the stony ground, this is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm but there is no soil of character, no depth, no roots. And so when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arise, there is nothing to show for it. The seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, but the weeds of worry and illusion about getting more stuff and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard and nothing comes of it. But finally, the seed cast on good earth is the person who hears and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Going back to our verse in Corinthians, who then are the people who are disqualified from salvation and eternal life? Well, it would appear to me that it's the first three, the seed that fell on the rocky soil, the, feed, the seed that uh, fell in the road and the seed that fell among the thorns and weeds because that word was received by those folks and yet the distractions of the world the worries of everyday life caused them to focus on something else caused them to focus on the word the world so they had an inadequate response They were preoccupied by something else rather than the word of the Lord. John, 1 John 2, chapter, uh, verse 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, but from the world. John is talking about the pride in our accomplishments and about idolatry of materialism, craving and accumulating things or obsession with one's status or importance, not focused on the word, not focused on God. So how do we ensure that we belong in the fourth group, those who heard the word and responded to the word 
and produced a harvest, an increase. If we go to Romans 2.13, it says, For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And from our 40 days in the word, we recall one of our memory verses, James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. The Christian author Alan Redpath writes, we are often very ready to examine and test others, but first we must examine and test ourselves. To examine yourself is to submit to the examination and scrutiny of Jesus Christ the Lord and to ask him to reveal that that is in you that grieves the spirit. And then to ask him to give you the grace that it might be put away and cleansed with his precious blood. In Psalms 139 we read, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxiety and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So only through periodic self-examination of ourselves can we be, avoid being deceived, as James talks about. Let's not be concerned about judging others. Let's get the log out of our own eyes first. So how do we do that? Well, here are some examples and questions to help, help us to examine ourselves. Do I have a hunger for the word of God do I diligently read it and study it and try to understand what God is telling me? Deuteronomy 4.29 says, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Is Christ in me? Am I keeping his commandments? 1 John 2.5 says, Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. Another question, how am I doing in my relationships with other people? John again, 1334, says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In Philippians, Paul says, Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. So how's my relationship with my church? Am I com as committed to my church as Jesus is committed, as, is committed to me? Am I fully involved in the life of the church? Do my family and I reap the benefits that come as a result of being committed to a church that preaches God's word? And am I bearing fruit? In John 15, 8, he talks about, by this, by bearing fruit, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. And Galatians, 1522, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in Titus 314, Paul writes, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. How's our attitude of discipleship? Do we love God's word? Do we love truth? John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if we go back to our, our verse for the day, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. The fact is that you and I need to test our conversion to make sure it's genuine. There's too much at stake. Eternity hangs in the balance. If we have any doubts whatsoever, 
We need to repent of our sins and receive Jesus Christ into our hearts and lives, submit to his lordship, and be obedient as he finishes his work in us. The verse said, surely you know that Christ is among you. You must know that Christ is in you, that Christ is in your heart. Let's examine our hearts. Examine them to make sure that we are in the faith, that our hearts have been transformed, and that our works flow from our love of Jesus Christ, and so know that we have everlasting life. It would be a horrible thing to arrive at the seat of judgment and hear the words of condemnation that were spoken by Jesus in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, but Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, but I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, these folks were doing all kinds of good works. They were casting out demons. They were doing wonders in his name. So, if they don't get into heaven, what does it take? It's not just good works by themselves, and it's not just a, a profession of faith. They work together. Works and faith. Genuine faith will automatically manifest itself and produce good works. These, these works uh, come at the prompting of the Holy Spirit within us. It's a change of, of attitude in our heart. It's a personal relationship with Christ, a desire to do God's will, not our own, to submit. If we can't point to some definite pos positive changes that God is making in our lives, then we need to ask God to correct our course because the true faith and salvation will result in continual and sometimes dramatic transformation in our lives. If we can't demonstrate the kind of fruit that we've been talking about, then we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will sanctify us and test us. We need to be obedient and submit to his will and his direction. Our confidence resides in God's deliverance from all sin and condemnation. Our confidence never re resides in our, in our uh, pitiful human efforts, but in God's saving grace in those efforts. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you examine our hearts, that you purify us, that you find us obedient in your will, that you send the Holy Spirit, Lord, to help us as our helper, to, to assist us in our walk of faith. Lord, we're, we know we're not what we were, but we know we're not what we should be. We know we're not what we could be. And so we ask that you come into our lives, Lord, that you further strengthen us and that you show us your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Have a good day.